Welcome to the Animated General, where we delve into historical events with depth and clarity. In this episode, we explore the myth and reality behind Blitzkrieg in the context of Germany's invasion of Poland. Join us as we navigate through differing interpretations by renowned historians, shedding light on the complexities of military strategy and tactics during World War II. The invasion of Poland, a pivotal event in history, unfolded between September 1 and October 6, 1939, setting the stage for World War II. This coordinated assault, known by various names including the September Campaign, the Polish Campaign, and the War of Poland of 1939, saw Nazi Germany, the Slovak Republic, and the Soviet Union launch a joint attack on the Republic of Poland. The invasion commenced just one week after the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between Germany and the Soviet Union, with the Soviet Union's approval coming swiftly from the Supreme Soviet on September 17. As the dust settled on October 6, the spoils of war were divided and annexed, with Germany and the Soviet Union carving up Poland as per the terms outlined in the German-Soviet Frontier Treaty. In Poland, this tumultuous period is remembered as the September Campaign, Kampania Znajowa, or the 1939 Defensive War, Wojna Obrana 1939 Roku, while in Germany it's referred to as the Poland Campaign, Uberfall auf Poland, Polenfeldzug. Following the Gleibitz incident, German forces swiftly launched a multi-pronged invasion of Poland, striking from the north, south, and west. Simultaneously, Slovak military units advanced alongside their German counterparts in northern Slovakia. As the formidable Wehrmacht advanced, Polish forces strategically withdrew from their forward positions near the Germany-Poland border, regrouping along more fortified defense lines to the east. Despite Polish resistance, the tide turned decisively against them after the Battle of the Bzura in mid-September, granting the Germans a significant upper hand. With defeat looming, Polish forces retreated southeastward, converging on the Romanian bridgehead, where they braced for a prolonged defense while anticipating support from France and the United Kingdom. On September 3, in accordance with their alliance commitments to Poland, the United Kingdom and France declared war on Germany. However, their actual assistance to Poland remained limited. France initiated the Saar Offensive, launching a small incursion into Germany, but the Polish army found itself overwhelmed even before the British Expeditionary Force could be mobilized and transported to Europe. By the end of September, the bulk of the BIF was stationed in France, unable to intervene effectively in Poland's defense. On September 17, the Soviet Red Army crossed into eastern Poland, occupying territories beyond the Kurzon line as stipulated in the secret protocols of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. This unexpected second front rendered Poland's defensive strategy obsolete, prompting the government to abandon plans to hold the Romanian bridgehead. An urgent evacuation of all troops to neutral Romania was ordered. By October 6, following the Polish defeat at the Battle of Kock, German and Soviet forces solidified their control over Poland, effectively signaling the demise of the Second Polish Republic. Despite this, Poland never formally surrendered. In the aftermath, Germany wasted no time in asserting its dominance. On October 8, Western Poland, including the former free city of Danzig, was directly annexed by Germany. The remaining territory came under the administration of the general government. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union absorbed its newly acquired lands into its Bielorussian and Ukrainian republics, swiftly initiating a campaign of Sovietization. Despite the occupation, a resilient spirit emerged. Underground resistance movements coalesced to form the Polish underground state within the remnants of the former Polish territory. Many military exiles who managed to escape joined the Polish armed forces in the West, remaining loyal to the Polish government in exile. On January 30, 1933, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, led by Adolf Hitler, ascended to power in Germany. While certain dissenting factions within the Weimar Republic had harbored ambitions of annexing Polish territories, it was Hitler's vision, rather than any pre-existing Weimar plans, that set the stage for the invasion and partition of Poland alongside the annexation of Bohemia and Austria. This grand scheme also included the establishment of satellite states economically subservient to Germany. Initially, Hitler pursued a policy of reconciliation with Poland, aiming to cultivate a positive image domestically. This effort culminated in the signing of the German-Polish Non-Aggression Pact in 1934. Moreover, Hitler's foreign policy endeavors aimed to weaken Poland's ties with France and coax Poland into joining the Anti-Comintern Pact, thereby forming a united front against the Soviet Union. Under the guise of diplomatic gestures, Poland was offered territorial concessions in Ukraine and Belarus in exchange for aligning with Germany against the Soviet Union. However, these concessions came with significant strings attached, effectively relegating Poland to a position of dependency on Germany, resembling little more than a client state. 
Understandably, Polish leaders harbored deep concerns over the erosion of their nation's independence. Hitler's disdain for Polish sovereignty was evident early on, as he had previously dismissed the legitimacy of Poland's independence in a 1930 publication, likening Poles and Czechs to inhabitants of colonies such as Sudan or India, unworthy of statehood rights. This ideological stance foreshadowed the ominous intentions that would later unfold with the invasion of Poland. The sentiment for annexation by Germany was strong among the populace of the free city of Danzig, as well as among many ethnic Germans residing in the Polish territory that severed East Prussia from the rest of the Reich. The Polish Corridor, a strip of land with a predominantly Polish population, had long been a source of contention between Poland and Germany. Following the Treaty of Versailles, the corridor was integrated into Poland, further exacerbating tensions. The desire for reunification with Germany extended beyond just the corridor. The urban port city of Danzig, with its predominantly German population, had been separated from Germany and transformed into the nominally independent free city after World War I. Hitler capitalized on this discontent, using it as a pretext for war. He portrayed the plight of the German minority in the corridor and Danzig as justification for reclaiming lost territories and restoring Germany's pre-1918 borders. Appealing to German nationalism, Hitler promised to liberate the German communities in the corridor and Danzig, invoking a sense of historical injustice and rallying support for his expansionist agenda. This rhetoric served as a potent casus belli, fueling aspirations of reversing territorial losses and fulfilling the aspirations of German nationalism. Germany dubbed the invasion as the 1939 defensive war, Verteidigungskrieg, with Hitler asserting that Poland had initiated hostilities by attacking Germany. Hitler's narrative portrayed Germans in Poland as victims of brutal persecution and violent expulsion from their homes. He justified the invasion by citing a purported series of border violations, which he deemed intolerable for a nation of Germany's stature. According to Hitler, these actions demonstrated Poland's disregard for the integrity of the German frontier, thus warranting a defensive response from Germany. Despite not being a party to the Munich Agreement, Poland played a role in the partition of Czechoslovakia that ensued. Leveraging the political climate following the Munich Agreement, Poland coerced Czechoslovakia into surrendering the region of Seski Tessin by issuing an ultimatum on September 30, 1938. Czechoslovakia acquiesced to the demand on October 1. Seski Tessin, with its Polish majority, had been a point of contention between Czechoslovakia and Poland since the aftermath of World War I. Poland's annexation of Slovak territory, comprising several villages in the regions of Chadza, Orava, and Spis, later provided the justification for the Slovak state to align itself with the German invasion of Poland. As early as 1937, Germany intensified its demands for Danzig, proposing the construction of an extraterritorial roadway, part of the Reichsautobahn system, to connect East Prussia with the heart of Germany, traversing through the Polish quarter. Poland firmly rejected this proposition, fearing that acquiescing to such demands would progressively subjugate the nation to German influence, potentially leading to a loss of independence akin to what Czechoslovakia had experienced. Polish leaders harbored deep-seated mistrust towards Hitler's intentions, recognizing the peril posed by Germany's growing strength and assertiveness. Concurrently, the British also viewed with apprehension Germany's escalating power, which threatened the delicate balance of power in Europe. In response to these mounting tensions, on March 31, 1939, Poland forged a military alliance with the United Kingdom and France, banking on their support to defend its independence and territorial integrity in the face of German aggression. However, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and his Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax, pursued a more conciliatory approach. They hoped to strike a deal with Hitler, potentially involving concessions regarding Danzig and the Polish corridor, in a bid to avert war. Chamberlain and his allies believed that by addressing Germany's grievances, they could prevent further aggression and maintain peace in Europe. Privately, Hitler downplayed the significance of Danzig, emphasizing instead his broader ambitions for Lebensraum, or living space, for Germany. This underscored the existential stakes at play, with German hegemony over Central Europe looming large on the geopolitical horizon. As tensions reached a boiling point, Germany adopted a stance of aggressive diplomacy. On April 28, 1939, Hitler made a unilateral decision to withdraw from both the German-Polish Non-Aggression Pact of 1934 and the Anglo-German Naval Agreement of 1935. Negotiations regarding Danzig and the corridor faltered, leading to a prolonged period of diplomatic deadlock between Germany and Poland. During this lull in diplomatic activity, German authorities learned of the failure of France and Britain to secure an alliance with the Soviet Union against Germany. Moreover, they discovered that the Soviet Union was open to the prospect of aligning with Germany against Poland. Sensing an opportunity, 
Hitler authorized preparations for a potential military solution to what he termed the Polish problem, as outlined in the case White scenario. In May, as his generals were busy devising plans for the invasion of Poland, Hitler addressed them directly, emphasizing that this invasion would not be met with the same ease as the annexation of Czechoslovakia. This statement underscored the gravity of the impending conflict and the anticipated resistance from Poland. In a stark address to his military commanders, Hitler outlined the objectives of the impending war. He emphasized the ruthless nature of the conflict, declaring that the goal was to physically annihilate the enemy. Hitler revealed his intent to deploy specialized death's head formations, tasked with mercilessly exterminating individuals of Polish descent or language. This brutal strategy, he asserted, was necessary to secure the living space required for Germany's expansion. Just days before the outbreak of war, on August 22, Hitler delivered this chilling message at the Oberzaltsberg. Meanwhile, on the diplomatic front, Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, a non-aggression pact between Germany and the Soviet Union. This pact, signed on August 23, sealed the fate of Poland and paved the way for the impending conflict. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, signed on August 23, came as a surprise to many, marking the culmination of secret negotiations between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in Moscow. This pact effectively eliminated the possibility of Soviet opposition to a potential campaign against Poland, signaling the imminent onset of war. Notably, the Soviets agreed not to come to the aid of France or the UK in the event of a conflict over Poland, and a secret protocol outlined the division of Eastern Europe, including Poland, into spheres of influence. Under this arrangement, Germany would control the western one-third of Poland, while the eastern two-thirds would fall under Soviet influence. Originally slated to commence at 4 a.m. on August 26, the German assault was postponed due to unforeseen developments. On August 25, the Polish-British Common Defense Pact was signed, with Britain pledging to defend Polish independence. This unexpected turn prompted Hitler to reconsider his strategy, as it contradicted his desired narrative for the conflict. In response, he postponed the invasion until September 1, effectively halting the entire operation in mid-leap. This delay bought valuable time and altered the course of events, shaping the trajectory of the impending conflict. Despite the overall postponement of the invasion, a German sabotage group launched an attack on the Yablonkov Pass and Mosty railway station in Silesia during the night of August 25-26. This operation, conducted without knowledge of the delay, was swiftly repelled by Polish forces on the morning of August 26. The German authorities dismissed the incident as the action of a deranged individual, labeling it the Jablonkow incident. On August 26, Hitler made efforts to dissuade British and French intervention in the looming conflict. He even went as far as offering future assistance from the Wehrmacht forces to Britain's empire. Convinced by negotiations that the Western Allies were unlikely to declare war on Germany, Hitler believed that even if they did, the absence of territorial guarantees to Poland would lead to negotiations favoring Germany after its conquest of Poland. Meanwhile, heightened reconnaissance flights and troop movements across borders signaled the impending outbreak of war. On August 29, under pressure from the British, Germany extended one final diplomatic offer, as the rescheduling of Fall Weiss, the codename for the invasion of Poland, had not yet occurred. Responding that evening, the German government outlined its demands, which now included not only the restoration of Danzig but also the Polish corridor, a new addition to Hitler's previous demands, as well as the protection of the German minority in Poland. They expressed willingness to enter negotiations but stipulated that a Polish representative with the authority to sign an agreement must arrive in Berlin the next day, while they prepared a set of proposals. The British cabinet welcomed the prospect of negotiations but viewed the demand for an immediate arrival of a fully empowered Polish representative as an unacceptable ultimatum, given the recent coercion faced by Emil Acha to sign away Czechoslovakia. On the night of August 30-31, German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop presented a 16-point proposal to Ambassador Naval Henderson. When Henderson requested a copy to transmit to the Polish government, Ribbentrop refused, citing the absence of the required Polish representative by midnight. Subsequently, when Polish Ambassador Lipski met with Ribbentrop on August 31 to convey Poland's willingness to negotiate, he stated that he lacked full signing authority. Ribbentrop promptly dismissed him, and it was announced that Poland had rejected Germany's offer, effectively terminating negotiations. Shortly thereafter, Hitler ordered the invasion to proceed. On August 29, Polish Minister of Foreign Affairs Józef Beck initially ordered military mobilization, but succumbed to pressure from Great Britain and France, leading to the cancellation of the mobilization. However, when the final mobilization commenced, it only added to the confusion surrounding the situation. The following day, August 30, 
the Polish Navy dispatched its destroyer flotilla to Britain as part of the Peking plan. Simultaneously, Marshal of Poland Edward Ride Smigley announced the mobilization of Polish troops. However, under pressure from the French, who were still hopeful for a diplomatic resolution, Ride Smigley revoked the mobilization order. Unfortunately, this decision failed to acknowledge that the Germans were already fully mobilized and amassed along the Polish border. During the night of August 31st, the Gliwice incident occurred, a false flag attack on a radio station near the border city of Gliwice in Upper Silesia. German units posing as Polish troops carried out this operation as part of Operation Himmler. Hitler subsequently ordered hostilities against Poland to commence at 4:45 a.m. the following morning, September 1st. However, due to the earlier stoppage of mobilization, Poland managed to mobilize only about 70% of its intended forces. This delay meant that many units were still in the process of forming or relocating to their designated frontline positions. As a result, the late mobilization significantly reduced the combat capability of the Polish army by approximately one third. Germany possessed a considerable numerical advantage over Poland and had built up a formidable military force before the conflict erupted. The Heer Army boasted an inventory of 3,472 tanks, with 2,859 deployed within the field army and 408 with the replacement army. Among these, 453 tanks were allocated to four light divisions, while an additional 225 tanks served in detached regiments and companies. Notably, the Germans fielded seven Panzer divisions, equipped with a total of 2,009 tanks, and operated under a new operational doctrine. This doctrine emphasized coordinated action between different military elements, with Panzer divisions tasked with piercing enemy lines, isolating selected units, and facilitating their encirclement and destruction. Following this initial assault, less mobile mechanized infantry and foot soldiers would advance. The Luftwaffe Air Force provided crucial tactical and strategic air power, notably deploying dive bombers that disrupted enemy supply lines and communications. These innovative tactics earned the moniker Blitzkrieg or Lightning War. While some historians like Basil Little Hart viewed the campaign in Poland as a full demonstration of the Blitzkrieg theory, others hold differing opinions. Aircraft played a pivotal role in the conflict, with bombers targeting cities and inflicting significant casualties among the civilian population through terror bombing and strafing. The Luftwaffe boasted a formidable force, comprising 1,180 fighters, 290 Ju-87 Stuka dive bombers, 1,100 conventional bombers, predominantly Heinkel He-111s and Dornier Du-17s, and a variety of 550 transport and 350 reconnaissance aircraft. In total, Germany possessed nearly 4,000 aircraft, the majority of which were modern. A significant portion of this air power, totaling 2,315 aircraft, was allocated to Operation Weiss. Owing to its prior involvement in the Spanish Civil War, the Luftwaffe likely stood as the most experienced, well-trained, and well-equipped air force worldwide by 1939. Emerging as an independent nation in 1918 following 123 years of partition, the Second Polish Republic faced significant economic challenges compared to nations like the United Kingdom or Germany. Predominantly agricultural, Poland had not seen substantial investment in industrial development, particularly in armaments production in ethnically Polish regions during the partition era. Additionally, the aftermath of World War I left Poland grappling with considerable damage, necessitating the establishment of a defense industry virtually from scratch. Between 1936 and 1939, Poland embarked on a substantial investment drive, notably establishing the central industrial region to bolster its industrial capabilities. While preparations for defensive measures against Germany had been underway for years, most plans envisioned conflicts erupting no earlier than 1942. To finance industrial expansion, Poland resorted to selling much of the modern equipment it had produced. In 1936, the creation of a national defense fund aimed to gather the necessary resources for strengthening the Polish armed forces. Despite having approximately 1 million soldiers, not all were mobilized by 1st of September. Those who mobilized later faced significant risks, especially as public transport became targets of the Luftwaffe. Furthermore, the Polish military possessed fewer armored units compared to the Germans, and these units, integrated within infantry formations, struggled to effectively counter the German offensive. The Polish army's organizational and operational doctrine were deeply influenced by its experiences in the Polish-Soviet War. Unlike the static trench warfare of World War I, the Polish-Soviet conflict showcased the decisive role of cavalry mobility. Recognizing the advantages of mobility, Poland aimed to incorporate this element into its military strategy, albeit with limited resources to invest in costly and unproven innovations. 
Polish cavalry brigades, serving as mobile mounted infantry, achieved notable successes against both German infantry and cavalry units. However, the Polish military faced challenges in modernizing its equipment and infrastructure. An average Polish infantry division, for instance, was equipped with a substantial arsenal but relied heavily on horses for transportation, contrasting starkly with the more mechanized German divisions. The Polish Air Force, known as Lotnik II Wojskowa, encountered significant challenges in its confrontation with the formidable German Luftwaffe. Despite being outnumbered and operating outdated fighter planes, the Polish Air Force managed to disperse its assets effectively before the conflict began. Contrary to German propaganda, not a single combat plane of the Polish Air Force was destroyed on the ground in the initial days of the conflict. Although lacking modern fighter aircraft due to project cancellations and delays, Polish pilots were renowned for their exceptional training and skill. Their proficiency would later be demonstrated in the Battle of Britain, where Polish aviators played a significant role, underscoring their status among the world's best trained pilots. The disparity in air power during the Blitzkrieg invasion of Poland was stark. With the Germans enjoying both numerical and qualitative superiority in aircraft, Poland found itself at a considerable disadvantage. With only around 600 aircraft at their disposal, Poland's air force was outmatched. Among them, the PZL.37 Loss Heavy Bomber stood out as modern and comparable to their German counterparts. However, the Polish Air Force's arsenal was predominantly composed of older models. The PZL P.11 and PZL P.7 fighters, along with the PZL.23 Karos bombers, made up the bulk of their fleet. Despite their efforts to bolster resources, budget limitations hindered their ability to modernize in time for the conflict. A last-minute procurement of French and English aircraft, including Moran Saunier M.S.406 fighters and ferry battle bombers, arrived too late to see action. Poland's attempts to acquire advanced aircraft like the PZL.46 Some Light Bombers and the PZL.50 Jastrzysob fighter were also marred by delays and production issues. The outbreak of war further complicated matters, leaving Poland without the reinforcements they had hoped for. Despite their challenges, Polish pilots relied on their aircraft's maneuverability and diving speed to make the most of the situation, showcasing bravery and resilience in the face of overwhelming odds. Poland's tank force, though modest in comparison to its adversaries, comprised two armored brigades, four independent tank battalions, and a complement of approximately 30 companies of TKS tankettes, strategically attached to infantry divisions and cavalry brigades. At the forefront of Polish tank warfare was the innovative 7TP light tank, boasting the distinction of being the world's first tank equipped with a diesel engine and a revolutionary 360 degrees gun lack periscope. While the 7TP outmatched its German counterparts, the Panzer I and II, in terms of armament, production constraints limited its availability, with only 140 tanks manufactured prior to the outbreak of war. Poland supplemented its armored forces with a handful of imported designs, including 50 Renault R35 tanks and 38 Vickers E tanks, providing some diversity to their arsenal. On the maritime front, the Polish Navy operated a small but determined fleet consisting of destroyers, submarines, and support vessels. Most surface units adhered to Operation Peking, departing Polish ports on August 20 to rendezvous with the British Royal Navy via the North Sea. Submarine forces engaged in Operation Wark, aimed at disrupting German shipping in the Baltic Sea, albeit with limited success. Furthermore, Poland's merchant marine ships played a crucial role by joining the British merchant fleet and participating in wartime convoys, contributing to the Allied effort against Axis forces. Despite facing overwhelming odds, Poland's naval and armored forces demonstrated resilience and adaptability in the early stages of World War II. The masterminds behind the September campaign, General Franz Halder and General Walter von Brauchitsch, orchestrated a strategy of swift and decisive action, aiming to initiate hostilities without a formal declaration of war. This approach, characterized by mass encirclement and the annihilation of enemy forces, relied on a combination of infantry, artillery, and mechanized units. While the German infantry was not entirely mechanized, it benefited from rapid artillery and logistical support, augmented by panzers and truck-mounted infantry units known as Schutzen regiments. These elements facilitated agile troop movements, enabling the Germans to focus their efforts on specific sectors of the enemy front, encircle opposing forces, and achieve localized breakthroughs. Despite the existence of the pre-war concept of Blitzkrieg, championed by figures like Heinz Guderian, the campaign in Poland followed a more conventional approach. The German High Command's conservative mindset limited the role of armored and mechanized forces to supporting infantry divisions rather than pursuing deep penetrations into enemy territory. Poland's geography, 
featuring vast plains and extensive borders totaling nearly 5,600 kilometers, provided favorable conditions for mobile operations, particularly when weather conditions were favorable. However, Poland's lengthy borders with Germany, including East Prussia, and the southern flank exposed by the incorporation of Bohemia, Moravia, and Slovakia into the German sphere of influence, posed significant challenges for Polish defense forces. Hitler's ambitious timeline for the conquest of Poland clashed with the more cautious estimates of German planners, who believed the campaign would span three months rather than the demanded six weeks. Nonetheless, they devised a comprehensive strategy known as Fall Weiss, Case White, to fully exploit Poland's vulnerabilities. The German offensive unfolded along three main axes of attack. Western Front, Army Group South, under the command of Colonel General Gerd von Rundstedt, launched the primary assault from German Silesia, Moravia, and Slovakia. General Johannes Blaskowitz's 8th Army spearheaded the drive eastward towards Łódź, while General Wilhelm List's 14th Army advanced towards Krakow, aiming to flank the Carpathian defenses. The decisive blow came from General Walter von Reichenau's 10th Army, supported by armored units, as it thrust northeastward into the heart of Poland. Northern Front, Colonel General Fedor von Bock led Army Group North, comprised of General Georg von Kuchler's 3rd Army and General Gunter von Kluge's 4th Army. They struck southward from East Prussia and eastward across the Polish corridor, respectively, aiming to converge on Warsaw. Tertiary Assault, Allied Slovak units, part of Army Group South, launched a supplementary attack from Slovakia. To augment their offensive, the German minority within Poland engaged in diversion and sabotage operations through pre-war Volksdeutscher Zelbstschutz units. These coordinated efforts aimed to sow chaos and confusion behind Polish lines. All three prongs of the German assault converged on Warsaw, with the primary objective of encircling and annihilating the main Polish army west of the Vistula River. Initiated on September 1, 1939, Fall Weiss marked the commencement of the Second World War in Europe, setting the stage for the unfolding conflict. Poland's steadfast resolve to deploy its forces directly along the German-Polish border, influenced by the Polish-British Common Defense Pact, shaped the nation's defense strategy encapsulated in Plan West. Vital resources, industry hubs, and a significant portion of the population resided along the western border, particularly in eastern Upper Silesia. Polish policymakers were keen on safeguarding these territories, fueled by concerns that relinquishing disputed regions to Germany might lead to a repeat of the 1938 Munich Agreement, where Britain and France struck a separate peace deal with Germany. Lingering doubts about the extent of support from Poland's allies, who had not explicitly guaranteed the nation's borders or territorial integrity, further fueled Polish apprehensions. Consequently, the Polish government disregarded French counsel advocating for the deployment of forces behind natural barriers like the Vistula and San Rivers, despite some military leaders favoring such a defensive posture. The West Plan, therefore, allowed Polish armies to fall back within the country's borders, albeit at a deliberate pace behind fortified positions. This strategic retreat aimed to buy time for complete mobilization and set the stage for a coordinated counteroffensive, bolstered by support from Western allies. In the event of territorial losses, Poland planned to retreat southeastward, capitalizing on the rugged terrain, rivers like the Stridge and Dniester, as well as valleys, hills, and swamps, which naturally lent themselves to defensive maneuvers against the advancing German forces. Additionally, the creation of a Romanian bridgehead presented a potential opportunity to regroup and mount a formidable defense. The Polish General Staff commenced the development of the West Defense Plan on March 4, 1939, recognizing the imminent need to safeguard the western regions of the country. Anticipating that Poland would initially confront the enemy alone, the plan prioritized the defense of crucial territories while acknowledging the numerical and material superiority of the adversary. With a defensive stance in mind, Poland aimed to protect key western regions deemed essential for sustaining the war effort. The strategy relied on leveraging favorable conditions for counterattacks by reserve units while avoiding a decisive defeat prior to the commencement of Franco-British operations in Western Europe. However, the planned scope was limited to the initial phase of operations and lacked detailed elaboration. Meanwhile, British and French assessments diverged from Poland's optimism, estimating Poland's ability to withstand aggression for a shorter duration of two to three months. Poland, on the other hand, believed it could hold out for at least six months, counting on swift action from the Western Allies. However, the Allies' expectations of protracted trench warfare akin to World War I differed from Poland's anticipation of a more dynamic conflict. Crucially, the Polish government operated under the assumption of timely intervention by the Western Allies, without being informed of their Allies' strategic outlook. 
This reliance on assurances of swift relief shaped Poland's defense plans, highlighting the significance of international cooperation and support in the face of impending conflict. Polish forces found themselves thinly spread along the Polish-German border, with defense lines lacking cohesion and strategic positions often compromised by challenging terrain. This dispersed deployment strategy also exposed supply lines to vulnerabilities, exacerbating logistical challenges. A significant portion of Poland's forces, approximately one-third, were concentrated in or near the Polish corridor, rendering them susceptible to encirclement from both East Prussia and the Western Front. Additionally, another third of Polish forces were stationed in the north-central region, positioned between the major urban centers of Łódź and Warsaw. The forward positioning of Polish troops posed significant obstacles to executing strategic maneuvers effectively. Hindered by limited mobility, Polish units struggled to retreat from defensive positions swiftly, leaving them vulnerable to being overrun by the more agile and mechanized German formations. This disparity in mobility and flexibility further compounded the challenges faced by Polish forces as they grappled with the relentless advance of the German military machine. As tensions escalated, the British government urged Marshal Edward Smigley Rides to evacuate the most advanced elements of the Polish Navy from the Baltic Sea, foreseeing their vulnerability to swift destruction by the German military in the event of war. Aware that the Danish Straits lay within range of the formidable German Kriegsmarine and Luftwaffe, Polish military leaders recognized the slim chances of a successful evacuation post-hostilities commencement. Consequently, just four days after the Polish-British Common Defense Pact was signed, three Polish Navy destroyers executed the Peking Plan, evacuating to Great Britain. While the Polish military had made preparations for conflict, the civilian populace remained largely unprepared. Pre-war propaganda had instilled the belief that any German invasion could be swiftly repelled, leading to widespread shock and disbelief among civilians when faced with Polish defeats during the initial stages of the German invasion. The lack of preparedness among civilians resulted in panic and chaotic retreats to the east, exacerbating logistical challenges and dampening troop morale. Communication breakdowns were further compounded by disrupted lines caused by German mobile units and civilian congestion on roads. Compounding the confusion were reports from Polish radio stations and newspapers, often exaggerating or fabricating victories and military operations. Consequently, some Polish troops found themselves encircled or engaging in desperate stands against overwhelming odds, misled by false reports and the hope of imminent reinforcements from purportedly victorious fronts. Amidst escalating tensions and a series of orchestrated incidents by the Germans, including the infamous Gliwitz incident as part of Operation Himmler, which served as a pretext for German claims of self-defense, the first act of war unfolded on September 1, 1939. At 4.45, the aging German battleship Schleswig-Holstein unleashed its cannons on the Polish military transit depot at Westerplatte, situated in the free city of Danzig on the Baltic Sea. However, German incursions across the Polish border had already occurred in various locations before this event. Simultaneously, the Luftwaffe launched attacks on both military and civilian targets, including the city of Wielun, marking the onset of large-scale aerial bombardment in the conflict. At 8 o'clock, without a formal declaration of war, German troops initiated an assault near the Polish village of Mukra, igniting the battle of the border. Throughout the day, German forces launched coordinated attacks along Poland's western, southern, and northern borders, while German aircraft conducted raids on Polish cities. The primary thrust originated from Germany, pushing eastward through the western Polish border. Complementary assaults emanated from East Prussia in the north and the German-allied Slovak Republic in the south, executed by joint German-Slovak forces under Field Army Bernalok. These converging offensives bore down on the Polish capital of Warsaw, signaling the commencement of widespread hostilities and the unfolding of the pivotal Battle of Poland. On September 3, France and Britain officially declared war on Germany, yet their tangible support was notably lacking. Along the German-French border, only minor skirmishes occurred, as the majority of German forces, including a significant 85% of their armored units, were fully engaged in the Polish campaign. Despite initial Polish successes in localized border clashes, the overwhelming German superiority in technology, strategy, and sheer numbers compelled Polish forces to gradually withdraw from their defensive positions towards key cities like Warsaw and Lwów. The Luftwaffe swiftly gained air supremacy, leveraging its destructive capacity to disrupt communications and cripple Polish infrastructure. Through relentless attacks, the Luftwaffe effectively neutralized Polish airstrips and early warning systems, exacerbating logistical challenges for the Polish Air Force. Severely depleted supplies and the destruction of key air bases forced many Polish air units to retreat, with a significant portion seeking refuge in neutral Romania. The Polish Air Force, initially boasting 400 aircraft, 
dwindled to a mere 54 by September 14, with air resistance virtually ceasing as the main Polish airfield succumbed to German bombardment within the first two days of the conflict. In a coordinated offensive, Germany launched attacks from three directions on land. Gunter von Kluge commanded 20 divisions that penetrated the Polish corridor, converging with a second force advancing towards Warsaw from East Prussia. Meanwhile, Geert von Rundstedt led 35 divisions in an assault on southern Poland. By September 3rd, von Kluge's forces in the north had reached the Vistula River, a mere 10 kilometers from the German border, while Georg von Kuchler's troops were approaching the Narf River. In the south, Walter von Reichenau's armored units had already crossed the Warder River, with his left flank extending well beyond Wuj and his right flank reaching the town of Kielce by September 5th. As the German advance pressed on, the defenders of Warsaw retreated to establish a defensive line stretching approximately 48 kilometers along the Vistula River. Positioned between Puansk and Putus to the northwest and northeast of Warsaw, respectively, this defensive stance aimed to withstand the onslaught of German tank thrusts and provide a rallying point for Polish resistance against the invading forces. As the conflict intensified, the Polish right wing found itself pushed back from Chikanów, approximately 40 kilometers northwest of Putusk, with its pivot point centered around Puansk. At a critical juncture, Polish forces were forced out of Putusk, leaving their flank vulnerable to a potential German thrust towards the Vistula and Warsaw. Despite facing intense German resistance, the Polish defenders managed to reclaim Putusk, even capturing numerous German tanks after outflanking them during a counterattack. By September 8, one of Reichenau's armored corps, having covered an impressive 225 kilometers in the first week of the campaign, arrived at the outskirts of Warsaw. Light divisions positioned on Reichenau's right flank had reached the Vistula River between Warsaw and Sandomierz by September 9, while Lys's forces in the south secured positions along the San River north and south of Przemysl. Simultaneously, Guderian spearheaded his 3rd Army tanks across the Narf River, initiating an assault on the Bug River line that had already encircled Warsaw. Across the board, German armies made significant strides in executing their designated roles. Meanwhile, the Polish military found itself fragmented and disorganized, with some units retreating while others attempted disjointed attacks on nearby German columns, highlighting the challenges faced in maintaining coordinated resistance amidst the onslaught. In the initial week of conflict, Polish forces relinquished control over key regions such as Pomerelia, the Polish Corridor, Greater Poland, and Polish Upper Silesia, marking a significant setback for the Polish defensive strategy. Despite their efforts, the Polish plan for border defense proved ineffective in slowing the relentless advance of the German forces. On 10 September, Marshal Edward Ride Smigli, the Polish commander-in-chief, issued a directive for a general retreat towards the southeast, with the aim of regrouping around the Romanian bridgehead. Meanwhile, German forces continued to tighten their grip on the encirclement of Polish forces west of the Vistula, particularly in the Wuj and Poznan areas, while simultaneously penetrating deep into eastern Poland. The city of Warsaw, subjected to relentless aerial bombardment since the outset of the conflict, came under siege on 13 September. Concurrently, advanced German units reached Lwów, a major city in eastern Poland, further exacerbating the Polish defense's challenges. On 24 September, Warsaw endured a devastating assault, with 1,150 German aircraft participating in the bombing raids. The Polish defensive strategy originally outlined a plan of encirclement, wherein German forces would be allowed to advance between two Polish army groups positioned along the line between Berlin and Warsaw Wuj. Army of Prusy was tasked with intercepting and repelling the German spearhead, effectively trapping it. However, the success of this strategy hinged on Army of Prusy being fully mobilized by 3rd of September. Regrettably, Polish military planners underestimated the swiftness of the German advance, assuming that Armia Prusy would not require full mobilization until 16 September, a miscalculation that had significant repercussions on the course of the campaign. During the Blitzkrieg invasion of Poland, one of the pivotal battles unfolded along the banks of the Bzura River, just west of Warsaw. Spanning from September 9 to 19, the Battle of Bzura saw Polish forces from the Poznan and Pommers armies attempting to halt the advance of the German 8th Army. Initially, the Polish counterattack showed promise, but it ultimately faltered, leaving Poland unable to seize the initiative on a large scale. The German Luftwaffe played a decisive role in the battle, unleashing a devastating aerial offensive that shattered what little resistance remained. Swiftly destroying bridges across the Bzura River, the Luftwaffe then unleashed waves of Stuka dive bombers, raining down 50 kg light bombs on exposed Polish forces. As anti-aircraft defenses faltered and ammunition dwindled, Polish troops found themselves trapped and vulnerable. By September 12, 
nearly all of Poland west of the Vistula River had fallen under German control, with only Warsaw holding out as an isolated stronghold. President Ignacy Masicki and Marshal Edward Ride Smigli, recognizing the dire situation, evacuated Warsaw early in the campaign, eventually settling in Lublin before continuing southeast to Zalishiki near the Romanian border. Ride Smigli ordered a strategic retreat behind the Vistula and San Rivers, laying the groundwork for the defense of the Romanian bridgehead area. As the German advance pressed deeper into Polish territory, the question loomed large, would the Soviet Union honor its agreement to divide Poland? Repeated inquiries from the German government to Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov sought assurance on this matter. However, the Soviet forces remained stationed at their designated invasion points, awaiting the resolution of their ongoing conflict with Japan in the Far East. The culmination of the undeclared war with Japan, marked by the battles of Kalking Gol, brought about a favorable conclusion for the Soviet Union. On September 15, 1939, Molotov and Japanese Foreign Minister Shige Noritogo reached an agreement, leading to a ceasefire on September 16, 1939. With the Japanese threat neutralized, Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin wasted no time. On September 17, Soviet forces entered Poland, unimpeded by any Second Front concerns. The unfolding events dashed any hopes of a strategic retreat and reorganization for the Polish defense. With over 800,000 Soviet troops pouring into eastern Poland, the situation became dire. The Soviet incursion, in clear violation of numerous treaties including the Riga Peace Treaty and the Soviet Polish Non-Aggression Pact, caught the Polish forces off guard. Soviet authorities justified their actions by citing the need to protect Ukrainian and Belarusian minorities in eastern Poland, asserting that the Polish government had effectively ceased to exist. As the Soviet invasion unfolded in the east, the Polish border defense forces, led by the Korpus Okrony Pograniks, found themselves facing overwhelming odds. With approximately 25 battalions at their disposal, they received orders from Marshal Ride Smigli to retreat and avoid direct confrontation with the advancing Soviets. Despite these orders, sporadic clashes erupted, including the Battle of Grodna, as both soldiers and locals attempted to defend their city against the Soviet incursion. Tragically, the Soviets resorted to executing numerous Polish officers, even those captured as prisoners of war, such as General Józef Ols sign of Olczynski. Amidst the chaos, internal unrest further complicated the situation. The organization of Ukrainian nationalists rose against the Polish authorities, while communist partisans instigated local revolts, leading to civilian casualties and chaos. The NKVD swiftly intervened to quell these movements, imposing discipline with an iron fist. For the Polish government, the Soviet invasion served as a stark realization of the dire state of affairs. Prior plans for long-term defense against Germany and southeastern Poland, with hopes of Allied intervention from the West, crumbled in the face of Soviet aggression. Despite the bleak outlook, the Polish government remained steadfast in its refusal to surrender or negotiate peace with Germany. Instead, it issued orders for all military units to evacuate Poland and regroup in France, determined to continue the fight against Nazi tyranny. Amidst the relentless advance of the German forces, Polish resistance persisted as they sought to regroup in the Romanian bridgehead area. However, their efforts were met with fierce opposition. From September 17 to 20, Polish armies Krakow and Lublin found themselves locked in the grueling Battle of Tomaso Lubelski, the second largest engagement of the campaign. Despite their resilience, Lwów eventually succumbed to the combined pressure of German and Soviet forces on September 22. The city, besieged by the Germans weeks earlier, fell into Soviet hands as the Germans handed over operations to their newfound allies. In the face of escalating German assaults, Warsaw stood as a beacon of defiance. Defended by a mix of hastily organized retreating units, civilian volunteers, and militias, the city held out against all odds until September 28. Meanwhile, the Modlin Fortress, situated north of Warsaw, endured a relentless 16-day siege before finally surrendering on September 29. Though surrounded, some isolated Polish garrisons displayed remarkable resilience. The garrison at Westerplatte held out until September 7, while Oxywee managed to withstand the onslaught until September 19. The hell-fortified area valiantly defended its position until October 2. In the final days of September, Hitler addressed the populace in Danzig, signaling the imminent conclusion of the campaign. Amidst the unfolding events, Russia's decision to intervene in Poland under the guise of protecting the interests of the white Russian and Ukrainian populations added another layer of complexity to the conflict. While Russia justified its actions as a means of safeguarding minority rights, the cooperation between Germany and Russia sparked condemnation abroad. In England and France, the alliance between Germany and Russia was viewed as a heinous betrayal of democratic principles. 
Adolf Hitler himself commented on this perception, dismissing it as hypocritical given past alliances and failures. To Hitler, the success of the collaboration between National Socialist Germany and Soviet Russia contrasted starkly with the unsuccessful partnership between Democratic England and Bolshevist Russia. Hitler's remarks underscored his belief that Poland's fate was sealed, with both Germany and Russia ensuring its demise. The Versailles Treaty, which had shaped Poland's post-World War I boundaries, was effectively nullified in the eyes of Hitler and others. The events of September 19, 1939, marked a turning point not only for Poland but for the broader geopolitical landscape of Europe. Despite a fleeting triumph for the Polish forces at the Battle of Sak, where they managed to secure a victory, the outcome was marred by tragedy as the Soviets executed all captured officers and NCOs. As the Red Army surged forward, they swiftly reached the strategic line formed by the rivers Narf, Bug, Vistula, and Sand by September 28, converging with advancing German units. Meanwhile, on the Hell Peninsula along the Baltic Sea coast, Polish defenders valiantly held their ground against overwhelming odds until October 2. Their steadfast resistance served as a testament to the unwavering determination of the Polish spirit. The final chapter of the September campaign unfolded near Lublin, where General Franciszek Kleberg Samodzielna Grupa Operakena Polsi fought bravely until the bitter end. After a grueling four-day battle known as the Battle of Kock, they ultimately surrendered on October 6. With this surrender, the curtain fell on the September campaign, marking a somber conclusion to Poland's valiant struggle against overwhelming forces. The Polish campaign served as Hitler's inaugural step towards realizing his vision of Lebensraum, or living space, for Germans. Central to this endeavor was Nazi propaganda, which propagated the dehumanization of Jews and Slavs as Untermenschen, or subhumans, fostering a climate of brutality and aggression. From the onset of the invasion, the German Luftwaffe embarked on a ruthless campaign targeting civilian populations and refugee columns along the roads. The deliberate bombing of Warsaw alone claimed the lives of 6,000 to 7,000 Polish civilians, intended to instill fear, disrupt communications, and undermine Polish morale. The horrors of the German invasion extended far beyond aerial bombardments, with atrocities perpetrated against Polish men, women, and children. Both the SS and regular Wehrmacht forces engaged in widespread murder and brutality, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. The notorious Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler earned infamy for its role in burning villages and committing massacres in various Polish towns. Operation Tannenberg, a systematic campaign of ethnic cleansing orchestrated by various elements of the German government, resulted in the execution of tens of thousands of Polish civilians at numerous mass grave sites by the Einsatzgruppen. The toll on the Polish civilian population was staggering, with estimates ranging from 150,000 to 200,000 lives lost. Additionally, approximately 1,250 German civilians fell victim to the violence unleashed during the invasion while 2,000 others perished as members of ethnic German militia forces engaged in combat against Polish troops. These grim statistics underscore the harrowing human cost of Hitler's quest for Lebensraum. In the aftermath of the swift and devastating German campaign in Poland, observers marvel that the military prowess displayed by the German forces. John Gunther, writing in December 1939, described the German campaign as a masterpiece, unparalleled in military history. The territorial reorganization following the partition of Poland saw significant shifts in borders and spheres of influence. Slovakia regained territories previously annexed by Poland in autumn 1938, while Lithuania reclaimed Vilnius and its surroundings from the Soviet Union on October 28, 1939. To consolidate their control over conquered territories, the Germans established military districts in key regions. General Alfred von Vala Bockelberg oversaw the Posen military district, while General Walter Heitz commanded West Prussia. Civil administrative powers were delegated to Chiefs of Civil Administration CDZ, with Arthur Greiser and Albert Forster appointed to lead the Posen and West Prussian districts, respectively. Further administrative divisions were instituted with the creation of the Wuj and Krakow military districts, under the command of Major Generals Gert von Rundstedt and Wilhelm List. Hans Frank and Arthur Zeiss Inquart assumed civil leadership roles in these districts, respectively. Frank was also appointed as the Supreme Chief Administrator for all occupied territories. A secret protocol between Germany and the Soviet Union on September 28 modified previous agreements, shifting Lithuania entirely into the Soviet sphere of influence. In exchange, the dividing line in Poland was adjusted eastwards towards the Bug River. On October 8, Germany formalized its annexation of western Polish territories, appointing Greiser and Forster as Reichsstatthalter, while the remaining parts of Poland were administered as the general government under the leadership of Hans Frank. 
Despite the delineation of spheres of interest by water barriers, the convergence of Soviet and German troops occurred on multiple occasions throughout the early stages of World War II. One notable incident took place at Brest-Litovsk on September 22, where the German 19th Panzer Corps, under the command of General Heinz Guderian, had occupied the city within the Soviet sphere of interest. As the Soviet 29th Tank Brigade, led by Semyon Krivshain, approached, an agreement was reached between the commanders. The German troops withdrew, allowing the Soviet forces to enter the city, where they exchanged salutes and even held a joint victory parade before the Germans retreated westward behind a newly established demarcation line. However, not all encounters between Soviet and German forces were as amicable. Just days earlier, near Lvov, tensions escalated when the German 137th Gebirgsager Regimenter, Mountain Infantry Regiment, clashed with a reconnaissance detachment of the Soviet 24th Tank Brigade. After some casualties on both sides, negotiations ensued, leading to the withdrawal of German troops and the subsequent entry of Red Army forces into Lvov on September 22. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the invasion of Poland marked the beginning of a period during which the Soviet government attempted to rationalize Germany's actions as reasonable, despite mounting evidence to the contrary. Stalin, in particular, expressed a belief that the war would ultimately benefit the Soviet Union. This perspective, evident in Stalin's remarks to a colleague on September 7, 1939, illustrates the complex political dynamics at play during this tumultuous period of history. In the midst of the tumultuous events unfolding in Europe, Stalin articulated a perspective that underscored the Machiavellian dynamics of geopolitics. Viewing the conflict between capitalist nations as a struggle for global dominance and the redivision of the world, Stalin saw an opportunity to exploit the situation to the advantage of the Soviet Union. To Stalin, the war between capitalist powers presented an opportunity to weaken each other, thereby shaking and undermining the capitalist system itself. Hitler's actions, whether intentional or not, were seen as inadvertently contributing to this goal. Stalin saw potential in maneuvering and manipulating the rival factions, pitting them against each other to exacerbate their conflicts. In Stalin's calculus, the annihilation of Poland held strategic significance. By eliminating a bourgeois fascist state, the Soviet Union could potentially extend the reach of socialism into new territories and populations. This expansionist ambition aligned with Stalin's broader objectives of consolidating Soviet influence and spreading the socialist system. Stalin's remarks reflect a pragmatic and opportunistic approach to international relations, characterized by a willingness to capitalize on the chaos and upheaval of war to advance Soviet interests. The toll of the Polish campaign was staggering, with approximately 65,000 Polish troops killed in battle, while 420,000 fell into German hands and another 240,000 were captured by the Soviets, totaling 660,000 prisoners. Around 120,000 Polish soldiers managed to escape to neutral Romania, with another 20,000 finding refuge in Latvia and Lithuania, many eventually finding their way to France or Britain. Despite the losses, a significant portion of the Polish Navy successfully evacuated to Britain. In contrast, German personnel losses were comparatively lower, with approximately 16,000 killed in action. The outbreak of war following the German invasion of Poland caught many by surprise, as none of the involved parties, Germany, the Western Allies, or the Soviet Union, anticipated a conflict of such magnitude and global reach, surpassing even the scale and cost of World War I. It would take months for Hitler to realize the futility of his peace negotiations with the United Kingdom and France, culminating in what would become known as a truly world war, encompassing both European and Pacific theaters of conflict. While Britain and France declared war on Germany on September 3rd in response to the invasion of Poland, their actions had little immediate impact on the outcome of the September campaign. Notably, no declaration of war was issued against the Soviet Union. This perceived lack of support from their Western allies left many Poles feeling betrayed. British Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax justified the absence of a declaration of war against the Soviet Union by citing the obligations outlined in the Anglo-Polish Agreement of 1939. Churchill's assessment of the differing attitudes of the Anglo-French allies toward Nazi Germany and the USSR during the negotiations reflects a nuanced understanding of the geopolitical dynamics at play. He acknowledges the gross treachery displayed by the Russians during the negotiations but also recognizes Marshal Voroshilov's reasonable military demand for the occupation of Vilnius and Lvov as strategic objectives. Despite Poland's rejection of this demand, Churchill suggests that Russia's subsequent actions position them as adversaries rather than allies, a distinction he perceives as somewhat blurred given the circumstances. Churchill highlights the significance of Russia's rapid mobilization and movement of forces, which effectively created an eastern front against Germany. 
he emphasizes the strategic importance of this front, which compels Germany to divert substantial military resources to monitor and defend against the potential threat from the East. While acknowledging Russia's pursuit of its own interests, Churchill underscores the necessity of the Eastern Front in protecting both Russia and the broader European theater from the Nazi threat. He expresses a preference for Russian armies to be seen as friends and allies rather than invaders but recognizes the geopolitical realities that necessitated their strategic positioning. Ultimately, Churchill's remarks underscore the pragmatic approach taken by the Allies in navigating the complex web of alliances and threats in the lead-up to World War II, acknowledging the strategic imperatives that drove the actions of both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Hitler's explanation to his officers on May 23, 1939, clarified that the objective of aggression extended beyond Danzig to the broader ambition of acquiring Lebensraum, a concept detailed in the notorious Generalplan OST. The invasion wrought havoc on urban areas, blurring the line between civilians and combatants. The ensuing German occupation, both in the annexed territories and the general government, marked one of the most brutal chapters of World War II. Tragically, the invasion resulted in the deaths of between 5.47 million and 5.67 million Polish individuals, representing approximately one-sixth of the country's total population and over 90% of its Jewish minority. Among the victims, around 3 million Polish citizens, predominantly Jews, fell victim to extermination camps like Auschwitz, concentration camps, and numerous massacres. Civilians, regardless of their condition, were rounded up, taken to nearby forests, and indiscriminately machine-gunned before being buried. The intelligenzaktion operations of 1939 to 1940 saw approximately 100,000 individuals murdered, with about 61,000 being members of the Polish intelligentsia, including scholars, clergy, former officers, and others deemed political targets by the Germans. The pre-war compilation of the Special Prosecution book Poland identified these individuals as targets even before the outbreak of hostilities. The Soviet occupation from 1939 to 1941 further compounded the tragedy, resulting in the deaths of 150,000 Polish citizens and the deportation of 320,000 more. Those perceived as threats to the Soviet regime were subjected to Sovietization, forced resettlement, imprisonment in labor camps, the gulags, or outright execution, as seen in the notorious Cotton Massacre of Polish officers. Following the tumultuous events of October 1939, the Polish military forces that managed to evade capture by the Soviets or Nazis sought refuge primarily in British and French territories. These destinations were perceived as safe havens due to the pre-war alliance forged between Great Britain, France, and Poland. The evacuation wasn't limited to just the government, Poland's national gold reserves were also whisked away via Romania and transported to the west, notably to London and Ottawa. Approximately 75 tons, 83 short tons, of gold were moved, a cache deemed substantial enough to sustain an army for the entirety of the conflict. From Lemberg to Bordeaux, von Lemberg bis Bordeaux, penned by Leo Leitner, stands as a first-hand testament to the tumultuous battles that sealed the fates of Poland, the Low Countries, and France. Leo Leitner, a journalist and war correspondent, offers a rare eyewitness perspective, including a vivid depiction of the Battle of Wiedzierska Gorka. Joining the Wehrmacht as a war reporter in August 1939, Leitner rose to the rank of sergeant and chronicled his experiences in 1941. Originally published by Franz Er Nachfolger, the principal publishing house of the Nazi party, the book provides insights into the unfolding events of the time. Meanwhile, American journalist and filmmaker Julian Bryan arrived and besieged Warsaw on September 7, 1939, amidst the German bombardment. Armed with a single roll of color film, Kodachrome, and numerous reels of black and white film, Bryan documented the onset of the conflict. His lens captured poignant images of Polish soldiers, fleeing civilians, devastated homes, and even a destroyed German He-111 bomber, courtesy of the Polish Army's resilience in Warsaw. Bryan's photographs and film, collectively known as Siege, are preserved in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, serving as enduring testaments to the horrors witnessed during the invasion. During the tumultuous days of the Blitzkrieg invasion, the valor of the Polish cavalry emerged not in the romanticized image of charging tanks with lances and swords, but in their strategic maneuvers and fierce engagements against the advancing German forces. Take, for instance, the Battle of Tukola Forest on September 1, 1939. Here, the 18th Pomeranian Ulan Regiment, entrusted with covering the retreat of Polish infantry, found themselves confronting elements of the German 20th Infantry Division under the command of Heinz Guderian's 19th Army. Under the leadership of Commander Kazimierz Mastlers, the Pomeranian Uhlans launched a daring attack, compelling the 20th Infantry to retreat and scatter. This unexpected resistance disrupted the German advance, 
buying precious time for Polish forces. However, their triumph was short-lived as they soon faced a relentless barrage of machine gun fire from German armored reconnaissance vehicles. Despite their swift withdrawal, the Uhlans suffered heavy casualties, with nearly a third of their ranks falling victim to the onslaught. The aftermath of this fierce encounter attracted the attention of German and Italian war correspondents, who stumbled upon the haunting scene of fallen cavalrymen and horses amidst the wreckage of armored vehicles. Italian reporter Indro Montanelli, moved by the courage displayed by the Polish cavalry, penned a poignant article in the Corriere della Sera, immortalizing their bravery in the face of overwhelming odds. Contrary to popular belief, the Polish Air Force did not succumb to destruction on the ground during the initial onslaught of the war. Despite facing numerical inferiority, strategic redeployment saved many of their aircraft from the devastation that befell major air bases. By dispersing to smaller, camouflaged airfields just before the outbreak of hostilities, the Polish Air Force managed to preserve the majority of its fleet. Only a fraction of trainers and auxiliary planes fell victim to enemy fire on the ground. Throughout the early stages of the conflict, the Polish Air Force, though outmatched in numbers and technology by the formidable Luftwaffe, remained remarkably active. Operating with determination and resourcefulness, Polish pilots took to the skies, engaging their German adversaries with valor and skill. Despite facing overwhelming odds, they inflicted significant damage on the Luftwaffe, proving their resilience and tenacity. The toll of this aerial struggle was significant for both sides. The Luftwaffe suffered the loss of 285 aircraft due to various operational causes, with an additional 279 sustaining damage. Meanwhile, the Polish Air Force, while valiantly defending their skies, paid a steep price, losing 333 aircraft in the intense air battles that raged throughout the campaign's early weeks. Poland's resistance during the Blitzkrieg invasion inflicted significant losses on the German forces, challenging the notion of a swift and effortless conquest. While precise figures vary, estimates suggest that the Polish campaign cost the Germans approximately 45,000 casualties, along with 11,000 damaged or destroyed military vehicles, including a considerable number of tanks, armored cars, airplanes, and artillery pieces. What's striking is the comparison with the subsequent Battle of France in 1940. Despite facing an adversary much closer to parity in numerical strength and equipment, the duration of the September campaign was notably shorter. This underscores the formidable defense mounted by the Polish forces, especially considering their limited resources and the absence of fortified defenses akin to the Maginot Line. Moreover, the Polish army had strategic plans in motion, such as the Romanian bridgehead, which promised to prolong the resistance and challenge German advances. However, these plans were abruptly halted by the Soviet invasion of Poland on September 17, 1939, altering the course of the conflict. It's essential to note that Poland never officially surrendered to the Germans. Despite the occupation, pockets of resistance persisted, fueled by organizations like the Armia Krajowa, Henryk Dobrzonski's guerrillas, and the Lesny, forest partisans. Their unwavering determination kept the flame of resistance alive, inspiring hope and defiance amidst the darkness of occupation. The concept of Blitzkrieg, often associated with Germany's swift victory in Poland, has been subject to differing interpretations by historians. While it's commonly believed that Blitzkrieg was the defining strategy employed by the German forces, some scholars challenge this notion. Matthew Cooper, for instance, argues that during the Polish campaign, the use of mechanized units was primarily aimed at facilitating the advance and supporting infantry operations, rather than achieving strategic breakthroughs. He contends that the German focus was on physically destroying enemy troops through rapid encirclement and aerial bombardment, rather than the paralysis of command or breakdown of morale often associated with Blitzkrieg. Cooper further suggests that this approach, known as Vernichtungsgedank and rooted in historical strategies dating back to Frederick the Great, remained consistent with earlier military doctrines. He highlights shortcomings in tank utilization, such as concerns about flank security, which would later prove detrimental to German military prospects in subsequent campaigns. John Ellis supports this perspective, asserting that the Panzer divisions were often subordinate to infantry armies and lacked the strategic autonomy characteristic of true Blitzkrieg warfare. Zaloga and Matic add depth to this discussion by emphasizing the significant role played by German artillery in the Polish campaign. While the shock value of Panzer and Stuka attacks is often emphasized in Western narratives, they argue that German artillery inflicted substantial damage on Polish units, underscoring the importance of all branches of the Wehrmacht in achieving victory. These diverse viewpoints challenge the simplistic portrayal of Blitzkrieg and highlight the multifaceted nature of military operations during the early stages of World War II. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the complexities of Blitzkrieg and its application in the Polish campaign.
We hope this exploration has provided valuable insights into the realities of warfare and the diverse perspectives of historians. Stay tuned for more episodes of The Animated General, out.